Good afternoon. My name is William McClintock, and I'm a member of the Executive Committee for the Criminal Law and Procedure Practice Group, which has organized this afternoon's panel on violent crime. Our chairperson, John Richter, got stuck in Miami because of the tropical storm, and so uh, I've been deputized to quickly introduce our panel, who, our panel moderator, who I'm certain needs no introduction to this crowd. Uh, one quick uh, housekeeping note, if you are registering for CLE credit, just a reminder to use the QR code that's out in the hallways. So without further ado, I'll introduce our moderator this afternoon, who is Judge Amul Thapar, who currently serves as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit where he has served since 2017, and incidentally was President Trump's first nomination to the Federal Courts of Appeal. Prior to his service on the Sixth Circuit, Judge Thapar served as a judge on the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Kentucky, a district where he also served as the United States Attorney prior to joining the federal bench. Judge Thapar, welcome, and thank you for your willingness to moderate our panel this afternoon. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the Federalist Society having this panel in particular. I think it's very important today that we not only need the Federalist Society to do this, but we need other groups to do this, to bring speakers like this together to talk about violent crime. It's an issue affecting everyone in every phase of society, and it's an area we really can work together to solve problems. And so I think it's great to have four wonderful speakers like this that can talk about their different experiences, and hopefully you can take some of their ideas and put them into action in your own communities. We're gonna hear first from Erica McDonald. Ms. McDonald is a partner at the law firm of Fager, Drinker, Biddle, and Wraith. Prior to joining the law firm, she was the 36th U.S. Attorney for the District of Minnesota. As I told her, that's the greatest job she'll ever have, so the rest of her career is downhill. So if she comes up with good ideas, you should put them to action so she can feel good. In addition to leading her office, she was selected as one of the small group of U.S. attorneys to serve on the Attorney General's Advisory Committee, which is a committee that advises the Attorney General on policies nationwide that would benefit U.S. attorneys' offices. She was also chosen as one of the 16 commissioners of the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice. Prior to serving as a U.S. attorney, she served as an a judge on the district court in the Minnesota's first judicial district for over eight years and as an AUSA. After hearing from Ms. McDonald, we'll hear from Mr. Carrillo. Mr. Carrillo is the director of Giffords Law Center's Community Violence Initiative. He was raised in southeastern Los Angeles in an environment with gangs, drugs, and gun violence. So he knows this stuff firsthand. He began his career as a volunteer at a hospital-based violence intervention organization and in 2005 co-founded Southern California Crossroads, a nonprofit organization that provides violence prevention and intervention services throughout the greater Los Angeles region. In 2012, he co-founded the National Gang Violence Prevention and Intervention conference, which brings over 800 practitioners in the field of community violence together to share the best practice approaches to violence. After hearing from Mr. Carrillo, we will hear from Thomas Apt. Now, Mr. Apt teaches, studies, and writes about the use of evidence-informed strategies to address violent crime and other public safety problems. He is the author of Bleeding Out, The Devastating Consequences of Urban Violence and a Bold New Plan for Peace in the Streets. It was published in 2019. He also talks to media outlets often and has a TED Talk on saving lives by stopping violence that has been viewed more than 200,000 times. So that's your homework for tonight if you haven't viewed it to view that TED Talk. He also worked for Governor Andrew Cuomo and worked at Harvard in both the Kennedy School and the Law School. Finally, he was also Chief of, Chief of Staff to the Office of Justice Programs at the U.S. Department of Justice. Finally, last but not least, we'll hear from Mark Scott. Reverend Mark Scott is the Associate Pastor of the Azuna Christian Community in Boston. 
The Azuna Christian community seeks to follow Jesus' inaugural declaration to, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, preach good news to the poor. Reverend Scott is a fellow with the Seymour Institute for Black Church and Policy Studies. He currently works at the Boston Public Health Commission as the director of the Division of Violence Prevention. He's also the board chair for the Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, and he is a mem board member of the Ella J. Baker House, where he helped create the Violence Reduction Task Force. With that, I will turn it over to Ms. McDonald. Thank you. Good afternoon. A little bit closer. You know, our thought as a panel is uh, we're each going to have some brief introductory remarks that we've prepared. And then we plan to hopefully have a conversation with you all where we welcome questions, we, uh, encourage questions, not the hard ones. No, you can hard, ask the hard ones too. But um, I can tell you it's a really thoughtful panel that was put together here today. I know that my colleagues Tony Bacon and Mike Hurst had a big hand in that. And the reason I say it's very thoughtful is because uh, to combat violent crime, it really has to be a whole systems approach. Law enforcement can't get it done alone. We can't do it without the buy-in of our community and we can't do it without the support of our faith leaders, and we have to have evidence-based programs. And so the fact that I'm sharing the stage up here uh, is no, it's no coincidence, because we know that this is what we need to do our work. You know, when I'm, so now I'm putting on my U.S. attorney and AUSA hat, um, and I can tell you that any responsible violent crime reduction program has to have three components, prevention, treatment, enforcement. It's a three-legged stool. If you do not have one of those legs of the stool, your program will fail. And importantly, it requires collaboration. Collaboration not only among federal, state, and local officials, but also collaboration with the community and the support of our faith leaders. In Minneapolis, for instance, nothing gets done if you don't have the support of your faith leaders. So there's various forms of violent crime, and I didn't want to talk in a vacuum, so I thought I would specifically focus on gun violence and what we're doing from a treatment prevention and enforcement perspective, and then I'm going to turn it over to my panel members. I'm going to give you a few statistics that you probably have already heard or know, but just to kind of put this uh, problem in focus. In 2020, 77%, so in 2020, 70% of all homicides were gun-related, committed by a firearm. In 2020, we had record high sales of guns. And then there's a, port, a really important metric that we follow in law enforcement. It's called time to crime. In other words, the time that the gun is purchased to the time that the crime is committed with that firearm. And what we're seeing is a much quicker time to crime. And research shows that that is part of what is elevating our violent crime statistics as it comes to crime. Specifically, in 2015 to 2019, that time to crime was 13% of the, of the crimes were in less than a year. By 2020, 23%, so a 10% increase, 23% time to crime were less than a year. So talking about the enforcement perspective, and that's the easy part, right? from my perspective as an assistant U.S. attorney, as a U.S. attorney. We have various tools in our toolbox that we can use to address crime that involves guns. So, for example, we can prosecute folks that are prohibited persons in possession of a firearm. So not just felons, there's other prohibited categories. Um, if you're suffering from an addiction or if you have a mental health or let's say you have a domestic violence uh, conviction in your background, there's various ways that we can prosecute those cases. An important thing that we need to talk about is also pros prosecuting straw buyer cases. They're not the sexy of cases. Honestly, they typically involve very sympathetic uh, defendants because they are usually being used by someone to get that firearm, to get it into their hands. Um, but those are cases that we need to focus on as well. So we've got tools that we can use. But we really need to talk about prevention and treatment, and that's what I want to talk about here today. And so I want to talk to you, you know, there are community-based programs that are at the neighborhood level that involved um, addressing people who are most at risk for either being shot or shot at. And so specifically in Minneapolis, we had a program, or we have a program, I say had because I'm no longer at the office, regretfully, Your Honor, um, but we have a program called the Group Violence Intervention Program. And what that is, is an evidence-based program that targets young males who are either at risk for being shot or pulling the trigger. 
And I say it's evidence-based because we have a research partner, John Jay College, who is the one that pulls together the information at who, as to whom we should target. Now, I think you probably know this. It used to be back in the day that a lot of the uh, violent crime was gang-related. We're not seeing that as much today. We're seeing it more group-related, very loose groups. And typically, you know, while back in the day, maybe the gangs, you know, were motivated by a different factor, what we're seeing a lot now are social media beefs that blow up and turn into something uh, that results in a fatality. And so what we do in our group violence intervention program is we target those groups. We bring them in for a call-in. We talk to them from the law enforcement perspective. And then we turn it over to what's called the moral voice perspective. So it starts out with the mayor explaining to these young men why they're here. It turns next to Minneapolis PD, who says, if you're involved in this, this is what's going to happen to you. It turns to the county attorney who says, this is how I would prosecute you in my jurisdiction. And oh, by the way, you don't want to meet Erica, because let me tell you what happens when you go to the feds. And then I explain to them uh, the consequences that could happen if they're prosecuted federally. But then we explain to them, we're here because we want to keep you safe, keep you alive, and keep you free. We're not asking you to get out of your group or out of your gang. We're asking you to put down the guns. And we have a path out for you if you choose to do that. At a minimum, put down the gun, but we have a path for you. And we turn it over to the moral voice. And those are individuals in the community who all have felony level convictions on their record, who are now in involved in total's life work is getting these young men out of the gangs, out of the groups. And so they give them the opportunity for employment. They help them relocate them, if necessary, outside of their community. They help them get their driver's license. They help them uh, contact various law firms with pro bono programs that will help them with expungement. All of those things that give them a path out of violence, put down the gun, and to have a healthy, productive life. When I was a judge, and my guess is my, uh, my colleague sitting next to me, um, you know, I can't tell you how many men stood before me on the day of sentencing and said, Judge, I'm tired. I'm just tired. My friends are dead or they're in prison, and I'm just tired of this. I want to be done. And so that was the voice and that was the message that I told these young men, don't be there. You have a path out now. I can tell you it has tremendous success. I'll give you a few statistics from it. Um, since we launched the program in 2017, 400 people 400 young men plus have elected to accept services and to put down the guns. Of those, from 2017 to 2020, we saw a 73% drop in the number of group-involved gun cases. And in 2017, we saw a 55% drop in the number of gun cases related to these groups. 2018, it dropped again, 40% drop compared to 2018, and a 70 3% drop compared to 2016. And by 2019, we saw a 71% drop. Now, what happened in 2020, obviously, had a great impact on this program. Because of the pandemic, we could no longer have those in-person intervention meetings, and we saw crime going back up, and we saw group member violence um, related to gun crimes going back up. Luckily, we're past that now. We can start the intervention programs again and have those one-on-one -on -one in-person meetings. So I tell you that to say, you know, there are creative programs out there. This is a problem for all communities in all shapes and sizes. Um, it's a mistake to over, oversimplify the problem and point to one cause. But what it does require is that we work collaboratively as a group, um, all of us, to address, the crime, or to address the crime problem and to come up with creative solutions with a holistic approach. So then I'm going to turn it over. I think, Paul, are you next? I believe so. You are. <clears throat> Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, there it goes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a few things to share, and I'll try to stick um, to the time that I was given, and knowing that we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards. Um, so first, I, I want to thank um, you all for having me and giving me the opportunity to participate and share uh, my experiences. Now, I don't call myself an expert. I'm a person that has been through a few things and made a bunch of mistakes and learned a few things, and so I, I just like to share my experiences. I think in regards to, to violence, <clears throat> or, or more specifically gun violence, I think any community, in my opinion, that has more than 10,000 residents should be trying to cultivate a comprehensive strategy. 
Um, I was just in Uvalde two weeks ago for the second time, and there's 16,000 people there in that town. Very small town. At first, I thought it was 60. It's 16, one six. Um, it's a very poor community, very disenfranchised, and they just are lacking in so many areas. Um, and so it just kind of dawned on me that like, a town as small as this needs, needs a comprehensive strategy to address violence. Uh, I don't disagree with um, what, what Erica shared, although I have a different kind of view on things in terms of a comprehensive strategy and what that entails. And again, I don't disagree with the three-legged stool. But in my experience, um, a viable comprehensive strategy and an example that I can share with you is in Los Angeles. Um, Mayor Virig also created in 2008 the GRID office, Gang Reduction Youth Development. And the strategy included prevention efforts to keep young men and women from becoming involved in the criminal justice system and joining gangs, et cetera. An intervention component, which leverages folks with lived experience, oftentimes formerly incarcerated individuals who now want to be peacemakers and help their community, and oftentimes are the only ones that can engage those at highest risk, or I should say those that are willing to pull the trigger, producers of violence, in terms of the, uh, the interruption. Trans interrupting the transmission of violence. The third pillar is re-entry. Um, you definitely have to try to, you know, support those coming out of, of either juvenile hall and, or, and prison. And I mean, don't get me wrong, some folks won't make it, some folks don't want a program, some folks are just gonna commit themselves to a life of crime and, and et cetera. But in my opinion, I feel like the vast majority would respond if given uh, the right opportunity. Next is, is survivor services, which is the fourth pillar, and they're often forgotten. Um, and they can be your biggest advocates, your biggest assets or allies, I shouldn't say assets, um, to help solve the problem in the community. And these are mothers, um, anybody who's been closely in impacted by violence, perhaps they've been shot themselves or victimized. But these can be um, <clears throat> individuals that can be trained and mobilized and to help raise funds and just championing the efforts and also be part of the solution. And then, of course, law enforcement is, is a critical pillar of a comprehensive strategy. If um, I, I did some work in El Salvador and we had all the components except for law enforcement. And so we, were kind of, we would meet with the national police and the local police and kind of cross our fingers and say, we hope you'll support what we're doing, right? Um, but at the end of the day, in many situations, they just didn't care. So we were always kind of working against that and knew that we could only go so far if law enforcement wasn't an active participant and supporter of, of the strategy. Um, I will say that the GRID office had uh, a, a good run in terms of success. We had 50-year lows in homicides in Los Angeles it, uh, up until the pandemic. <clears throat> One of the things that is key, and I think Erica mentioned this, is the coordinating of a comprehensive strategy. It sounds good. Thomas and I talk about this a lot. It sounds good and peachy and, and, and you know all those good things when you talk about a comprehensive citywide strategy, but there are very few. And those that are out there are mostly dysfunctional, typically because of politics and egos. And, uh, but in LA, we had a run where we essentially had the chief of police, the sheriff, and the mayor all on the same page, all publicly supporting and promoting the strategy, even endorsing and promoting ex-offenders as part of the solution, which was like the first time nationally that a big city did that. Um, even when some of the folks who were violence interrupters got arrested because they kind of reverted back to their previous lifestyle, the chief, the mayor, and, 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 uh, and the sheriff stood firm and said, there's gonna be bad apples, but we're pushing forward and these guys are part of the solution. Um, things have changed, got a, new, we've got a new mayor, about to get a new mayor, our second mayor since Villarigosa. We, the sheriff at the time is incarcerated, Sheriff Baca for some other stuff, or you know, got himself into some trouble, or maybe he's on home arrest, and I'm not, not making fun of that, but it's unfortunate. Um, and we have a new chief, so, 
And the grid office is not, in my opinion, needs some innovation at the moment. It had a 10-year run, and with the pandemic, I think a lot of cities, like Erica mentioned, are trying to figure out now how do you kind of pivot back and get that momentum that a lot of us, some of us had before the pandemic. Um, I got a bunch of other stuff I can share later, but I'll leave you with this um, last thought for now, and I think Thomas is next. I agree 100% with the idea and the importance of evaluating violence reduction efforts. Like, we have to, right? Obviously, you want to know if it's working. Um, but I will say that most of the models that exist or that are the most popular, if we all, if I asked you all to write down on a piece of paper, what are the two or three most popular models that you've heard of in regards to gun violence prevention, you would probably all write down the same one or two. And the problem that I have with those is that they're very old. We lack innovation in this field. And so many things have changed. And I'll give you one, one, uh, one um, example. Is that social media is a significant part of all of our lives, right? I think Facebook blew up in, what, 2006 or whatever. It, but it is also very important in the lives of our youth. Even our youth and our individuals who are out there shooting people. And so, you know, gangs use social media to coordinate, to recruit, to promote violence, to threaten folks, et cetera. There is not one evidence-based model that addresses social media violence. So that in and of itself is proof that we lack innovation as a field, as professionals. Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you uh, here at the Federalist Society. It's also a pleasure to be with such uh, esteemed panelists. Uh, I agree with a lot of what's been said. Uh, you know, it's really encouraging to hear from a law enforcement leader like Erica uh, to be promoting this balanced approach. And I think you're hearing actually a lot of similarities between what she and Paul were, were talking about. Uh, the particular strategy she's talking about, uh, the group violence reduction strategy, uh, it's a bit complicated because uh, the, that strategy is known by like nine different names. So you may have heard of it as focus deterrence or operation ceasefire or GVI or GVRS. But it is an important strategy. And, uh, and I think it illustrates some principles that I'll, uh, I'll talk about. So it's good to hear uh, from Erica in that regard. Uh, Paul, as usual, I've known a long time, is selling himself unbelievably short. He is a, uh, a very important expert in this, uh, in this space and uh, has saved a lot of lives in L.A. and is now coordinating the, uh, some of these efforts national, nationally for Giffords. Um, I, and I, I think he's expressing a sentiment that you hear among... Uh, some of the most committed people in this space, which is a sense of impatience uh, and a sort of understanding that we need evidence-based practice, but that that evidence needs to evolve and we need space for, space for innovation. Uh, the fact that we really, um, we understand the importance of social, but Frankly, uh, you know, uh, we are not, uh, we don't have good intervention strategies for social is, is a real issue, and we're several years behind, and we need to catch up. So I would, uh, I would and, I, and I also think that he raises this issue of sustainability. Uh, focused deterrence was, for instance, remarkably successful, um, not only in Minneapolis, but in Oakland in recent years, cut violence by 50%. Given all of the political uh, and other turmoil uh, that happened uh, uh, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, uh, that, uh, that program that had a partnership between law enforcement, community members, and service providers became politically untenable despite its success. Maybe the same thing happened in Minneapolis. Paul is talking about one of the best examples of comprehensive strategies out there in LA with the transition in political leadership, that program didn't, uh, didn't die, but the, level of, uh, but the level of enthusiasm and support uh, waned. And one of the things I often talk about is we know how to reduce community gun violence in this country. We do it again and again and again. 
but we don't do it sustainably. And that is, I think, a real, uh, a real challenge. Uh, I also, I, I, I haven't heard yet what, what Mark will say, but I do think that, uh, Mark, you rep represent an incredibly important constituency, which is the voice of the faith, faith community. Erica said that as well. Uh, there has to be a moral component uh, to these things, and uh, I think that that's a really important voice, and you see uh, in many cities uh, a group of uh, increasingly clergy who are not just sort of sermonizing and moralizing, but really willing to get their hands dirty, uh, as you have done, and really you know, get into the details and the weeds of the policy and the work. Uh, I think that Based on my research, uh, I think that there are three fundamental anti-violence principles that sort of you, that I think sort of encompass a lot of what we've already talked about. And those three are focus, balance, and fairness. Uh, study after study after study shows that community gun violence is hyper-concentrated, not among large groups uh, of, you know, large demographic groups, but among these small networks uh, that Erica uh, alluded to. We also know that violence doesn't concentrate in quote unquote bad neighborhoods, but in micro locations known as hotspots. So what you might think of as a bad neighborhood is actually a neighborhood that may be overall mostly peaceful, but has three or four violent micro locations. And so it's very important to understand that uh, this violence is very concentrated. And so many of the most successful strategies target those concentrations and focus on the highest risk people, places, and behaviors. The second principle is the principle of balance. Uh, when myself and Chris Winship, my colleague from Harvard, conducted this systematic meta-review of anti-violence strategies, I thought there would be sort of a, a, at least a, some form of sort of preference or bias in the literature towards enforcement-oriented strategies. That was not ultimately what we found. What we found were a number of successful tough on crime strategies, if you want to use that term. We also found a number of successful prevention and intervention strategies that focused on supports, services, and treatment. And I think this sort of mirrors the broader reality, which is that if you want to incentivize human behavior, you have to think about carrots as well as sticks. And there's really no city in the, this country that has sustainably either arrested their way out of community gun violence or just programmed their way. And uh, I think that speaks to this broader uh, problem that we're having in this country, which is the way we talk about this issue, which is deeply partisan and hyper-polarized. Uh, there was a, a window a few years ago where it seemed that progressives and conservatives were really coming together uh, about how to move the system forward and address a lot of these issues. That's certainly less true today. And one of the challenges with that is most of the evidence-informed strategies that we're talking about are kind of somewhere in the middle. They're not particularly, uh, they sort of might not match up perfectly with what the hard right wants. And they don't match up perfectly with what the hard left wants. They have this, they have an element of enforcement, they have an element of prevention. And it's harder, getting harder and harder to make policy in the sensible center. And so I think that's a, a real challenge. And then the last thing I will say is that if you want to be sustainably su successful in this space, in addition to being focused and balanced, you must be fair. And what I mean by fair is your work needs to be perceived as fair and legitimate by the communities that are most impacted by it. And what we see uh, in these communities is they are often very unsatisfied with their law enforcement uh, 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 partners, but they desperately need their law enforcement partners. And one of the things that we uh, see is that people in these communities don't want to be over-arrested, over-charged, over-incarcerated, but at the same time, they feel unsafe. And they feel like while we're being burdened, by uh, the excesses of law enforcement, we're not being protected. And one of the things that we need to do is double down on that focus aspect and really focus on the most serious people committing the most serious offenses and not, as a lot of my law enforcement colleagues say, fish with a net. Uh, and so I think that's an important thing. 
Um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more to talk about, but I think that if we can create the political space to be both evidence-informed and community-informed, I think we can make real progress on this issue. Thank you. I'm very uh, happy to be with you here today. I'm going to really try to build on what the other panelists have said and also see if I can perhaps lay some foundation to a lot of this conversation. I want to focus on four things. Talk about faith. I want to talk about collaboration. I want to talk about both being very focused on a particular population, but also having a broad-based prevention approach. And then I want to talk about a public health approach. So on faith, uh, Jesus' inaugural address is made on a Sabbath day in the synagogue, which is a place he was in the habit of visiting. And there he quotes the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. It was to build upon this philosophical, political, programmatic statement that I moved in the fall of 1989 from a lovely apartment on the hill to join members of a tiny black Pentecostal church, the Azusa Christian community in the valley of one of Boston's most violent neighborhoods. All of my reflections and learning since then uh, are, 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 are from that. I won't go through the whole biography. You heard some of that. Uh, the thing I'll add to the biography is that I'm a, now a chaplain intern um, at Boston Medical Center's Violence Intervention and Advocacy Program, very similar to the hospital program that Erica mentioned. Uh, violence is the result of nihilism. In the spring of 1991, Cornell West and the journal Dissent published Nihilism in Black America. Professor West's comments apply more to some places and times than others, and they may be a bit over the top, an act that a preacher professor would be apt to commit, but they're worth hearing. Nihilism is to be understood here not as a philosophic doctrine that there are no rational grounds for legitimate standards or authority. It is far more. The lived experiences of coping with a life of horrifying meaninglessness, hopelessness, and most importantly, lovelessness. Nihilism is not new in black America. The first African encounter with the New World was an encounter with a distinct form of the absurd. The genius of our black foremothers and forefathers was to create powerful buffers to ward off the nihilistic threat, to equip black folk with cultural armor to beat back the demons of hopelessness, meaninglessness, and lovelessness. These buffers consisted of cultural structures of meaning and feeling that created and sustained communities. This armor constitutes ways of life and struggle that embodied values of service and sacrifice, love and care, discipline and excellence. Greed, hate, envy are spiritual ideas that must be counted by the spiritual ideas of faith, hope, peace, love, and joy. Religion is one way of organizing and implementing the ideals. The black church has been and now must be the invisible institution at the center of creating buffers against the nihilistic threat in this new world. Two, collaboration. The first two clauses of the First Amendment are an excellent frame for collaboration between communities, all communities of faith, civil society, and government. I have in my head also a diamond approach. You've heard three, everybody likes three, I'm gonna go with four, right? So uh, diamond, think of baseball, uh, Red Sox, uh, think of, uh, I heard that, right? Uh, bad, bad year, bad season, so we'll, we'll, next year, right? Uh, or a solid form of the element carbon. So faith is one. Uh, the law is two, inclusive law enforcement agencies and the criminal justice system. Three is nonviolent direct action. That's those members of the community that have been there, have experienced it, 
and are now in a position to contribute in direct engagement with the population that we're most concerned about and for public health approach. So on number three on this, uh, being very focused, uh, but also having a broad uh, prevention approach, it's walking and chewing gum at the same time. So a clear, sharp, sustained, very important word, focus on those, re on those families, violence functions in, in, in a family system, on those families most impacted by violence, and then an ever-widening efforts to prevent it from happening in the first place. So if you think of it as the fire, put the fire out, but then how do you help the people who are displaced by the fire? Why did the fire happen, and what are we going to do to stop it from happening another time? Uh, and then finally, number four, this public health approach. So I had a young man in the neighborhood, his name is Jimmy Dolphine, tell me you have to learn to peel back the onion. Ask the question, why? So we know we had a 14-year-old boy show up at school with a gun. So we can stop him, we can take the gun, uh, we can uh, go through a criminal justice process, we can adjudicate him delinquent, we can put him into a juvenile justice system, but why did he bring the gun to school? And you'll get an answer. Well, why did that happen? And you'll get an answer. And well, why did that happen? So peel back the onion. And then we'll also, uh, the technical term among my public health colleagues is social determinant of health. So I just want to tell the bridge story. So when we moved into that valley in the Four Corners neighborhood, there was a, 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 a main thoroughfare that came through the neighborhood, went over a bridge, there was a train track under it, and the bridge was uh, so decrepit, it was just shut down. They just shut it down. And it was shut down for year, over year, over year. So one of our advocacy things became, fix the bridge. So, and they fixed the bridge. Now the train that was on those tracks was the commuter train. It brought people from affluent suburbs to jobs downtown comfortably and conveniently. But there were stops in our neighborhood, but they were all closed. So then it became, fix the stops, fix the stops, fix the stops. So now that train stops in the neighborhood. But now that you have a train stop there, it becomes the, the property value begins to go up. So one of our church members, landlord, came to her and said, I'm going to raise your rent $500. Not much you can. And so she said, OK, I'm going to go buy a house. Uh, and so she got some support and help from the city, and then she's now a, a homeowner. But those kinds of things in a neighborhood are part of what create both safety and help. So pay, and I, I just picked one of them. Uh, um, uh, uh, transportation, which then led to an economic concern. So um, the thing I want to uh, repeat and sort of move towards closing with uh, is that communities face all kinds of threats. And this is something you, you've heard earlier. There are also all kinds of resources that will protect. And so I want to reference a meeting that we had in Boston on November 4th of this year, went from 4 to 5.30. Mayor was there, the police commissioner was there, the superintendent of schools were there, and then about a good dozen or so people who have been deeply impacted by violence and are now thriving contributors to their families and neighborhoods. And they had a whole host of ideas. So the, that cohort of folk and the ideas that they have are where you're going to find a lot of the sustainable solutions uh, to uh, this issue. Uh, Boston has experienced a difficult October. I live in Dorchester, one of Boston's neighborhoods. Boston, Dorchester has experienced a very difficult year. So uh, if you know Boston at all, uh, if you go to another one of the black communities in Boston, Roxbury, it's gone down. If you go to Mattapan, it's gone down. In my neighborhood, Dorchester, it's gone up significantly. We've had a number of juvenile homicides. Our overall rate is low. It's lower this year than it was last year. Uh, our 10-year average is trending downward. So we're doing things that work, but right now it feels terrible if you're a Dorchester resident. So the recent violence is difficult, very, uh, because violence is always present, lurking, and at times surging. And it's not possible to predict the future, but hopefully as the year passes, we'll see it go down, we'll see it shift around, but our collaborative efforts, 
uh, must be improved and sustained um, until we finally address the root causes and the things that create violence and we must remain committed to safety and even more peace. Let me close with the Afro-Asiatic wisdom literature of James, the Bishop of Jerusalem, where he declares religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Thank you. Before we open it up to questions, does anyone want to ask or, or talk about what anyone else did? In other words, any responses? Not me. No? Okay. Um, if you have a question, there's a couple mics. I'm going to lead us off with just a few, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So a couple of you, um, Erica and Paul, you mentioned the pandemic causing problems with the programs. Paul, you use the words pivot back. And I guess my first question for the two of you is how do we pivot back to get those programs that were working implemented again? And are they, Paul, to your point, really timely when we're facing new challenges that maybe those programs didn't address? And so how do we do it and move back to the successes we were having before facing the new reality? No. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the biggest issue, especially um, my community, like probably several of your communities, um, we're having trouble with law enforcement, obviously in Minneapolis, right? Our sworn strength was 900 in 20, I think it was 2018, 900. Then our chief had gone to Minneapolis City Council and said, based on all the statistics I have, we should have a sworn strength of 1,300. And to be clear, he is the, he's a black police chief, Rondo Arredondo, fantastic, well-respected. City council kind of lost their head on him. The sworn strength in Minneapolis now, the people on the street, is less than 500. And so we have so few resources, and these programs rely on those resources. You, gotta, you have to have, as we talked about, a carrot and a stick approach. And so the biggest thing we have to do right now is rebuild our law enforcement resources so that we can start doing programs like this again. Um, they're basically holding it together by a shoestring to have folks just on the street and responding to the emergency calls. Paul? Um, I was, um, when the pandemic started, I was still running my, my nonprofit organization in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. And during the pandemic, I, I joined Giffords. But, you know, I had many conversations with folks like Thomas and others and almost felt like at times that we should probably throw everything out pre-pandemic because the pandemic changed so many things, right? Communication, um, you know, the way folks move or didn't move, who you hung around, et cetera. But um, I, I, my staff in the midst of the pandemic, violence went down for a short period of time and we largely focused on... Um, preventing the spread of COVID. We partnered with LA County Public Health and we started um, hitting my same violence interrupters, street outreach workers. We're now canvassing the communities, handing out pamphlets on facts on COVID and where they can get vaccinated and passing out masks and hand sanitizer. So we ended up with like double duty, stopping the spread of, of COVID um, with pu Department of Public Health. And, and then soon after violence went back up again and obviously went up a bunch of places. So. I don't have an answer to that, to be honest, but I think it, it's a mix of things. You have to look at what's worked in the past, but then also be open to like this whole new world that we live in post-pandemic, so. You mentioned one of the things that I think we all grapple with, which is how do we get away from making this a partisan issue and start to implement solutions where we can get, you mentioned, the left and the right, but they often drive the train. You called it the left, right, and sensible middle, and the sensible middle tends to stay home a lot while the left and right drive the train. So how do you get the left and right to work together to come up with solutions that work? And who should lead that charge? You know, I've, I've thought a lot about that, uh, but I have, to, I have to admit, you know, I'm not a political expert. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a researcher and practitioner uh, and have been working in government for a long time. So I'm, I'm, I've been involved in politics, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily an expert in politics. 
Uh, but I do think that, you know, one of the things that's easy to say but very hard to do is to shift the frame of the conversation from an argument to be won to a problem to be solved. If you're talking about a problem, it's easier to evaluate various strategies in a less emotional, less combative way. If you're, if you're sort of it positioned in this sort of one side is right versus wrong, it's very hard to get things done. And in terms of uh, sort of making room for the sensible center, as I called it, and this is something that uh, the Council on Criminal Justice, where I work, uh, really tr uh, tries to achieve as a nonpartisan organization, uh, I think that it's really incumbent on folks, who, we have to police our own, meaning that I think that folks on the left uh, have to call out the extremism uh, when they see it on the left, and that the same thing is true on the right. We have to sort of insist on a responsible conversation. It's very easy to call out the other side. It's harder to call out uh, one's own side, but I think that that's really sort of a key issue. Uh, you know, I, I took a lot of flack uh, uh, after, uh, the, uh, after the murder of George Floyd in saying as a, as a committed progressive and Democrat that I thought defund was a terrible idea. I took a lot of criticism for that, but I think that, that was the right position to take uh, and I think history is, has borne that out. At the same time, uh, we have to be candid that you know, there was a massive sort of electoral strategy among some on the right, not all, to really create this sort of fear-based environment about criminal justice. And we have to address that as well. And so I think there's enough blame and enough responsibility to go around, but I think that sort of being, I think the people in this room, whatever group or, or group, group you belong to, you can use that credibility with that group most effectively. My final question, Reverend, you mentioned sustainable solutions. You're a pastor. How, how can you ensure, it seems to me that one of the things that was unique about what you talked about is that you are a pastor and you can impact a lot of people indirectly and directly. How can we rely on our church partners and others to really have sustainable solutions? I think, you know, we're, we're going to be here, right? Um, so I mentioned uh, 1989. That's when we moved into the neighborhood. We're still there, right? Our, our institutions um, last. Uh, we, we, we're not in general, cycling through from one administration to the other. So the work that we've done goes back to Mayor Flynn and then Mayor Menino uh, and then Mayor Walsh and then Mayor Janey and now Mayor Wu. And, and they're all very different. They have very different strategies, but we're always present and there. Uh, and I can remember going into a church for a funeral. It was a terrible homicide. Uh, and... Uh, the young man would have had uh, no involvement in the church at all, but his grandmother did. And so uh, that, that family dynamic, that, that supporting through three generations of uh, the family there, I mean, we're just, we're there, and because of that, that construct that's in the First Amendment, we're, we're not, we're, we're, we, sh we shouldn't be, and we're not, for the most part, right, partisan, right? So it, it, we're able to take a step back, stay here for a long period of time. We're on the 2,000 year plan for those of us who are Christians. Uh, and um, uh, it's just stay, stay engaged. I would say, I, there, there are tips I give um, secular organizations, governmental organizations in working with the faith community. One is don't pick favorites. Don't like that preacher, I don't, and that, but not that one over there. Don't pick favorites. Um, I would, um, um, uh, you know, also say uh, that you, you want to, there, there's sort of faith in general, faith community, but then you have faith communities that will come up with specific programming, right? And so, uh, invest, now that will, that will need to be re-innovated, uh, uh, 
evaluated, like any other kind of programming. Uh, but if you can find specific programming uh, that churches can do, and the last thing I'll say on that, you talked about the, the moral voice, right? And so I, I, I've been in those conversations in the courtroom with an audience, and you've got the law enforcement community and the moral voice, and you sprinkle in some uh, uh, of the faith community, the, 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 the very, it's a very powerful voice for somebody to say, I did this, I was involved in that, I, I went to prison, I'm home, I'm working, I'm thriving, I'm married, I'm taking care of my family. It's a very powerful voice. They may, may or may not be religious, but then you back that up also with the, with the faith voice, just, you can always find it, it's in every city, and then those things can be sustained. Okay. Uh, Thank you for this panel. Uh, Diego Pastana from Tampa, Florida. Um, I wonder if the panelists could speak to um, nonviolent uh, crimes and how, how those might be indicators of future violent crimes and, and how, how does do prosecutors or, or legislators or anyone strike the balance between overcharging uh, for a seemingly nonviolent or innocuous crime and nipping in the bud what might be the first step to violent crime? I'm trying to decide which one of us is the best one to answer that. Um, you know, I mean, so from a, from a prosecutor's perspective, um, especially from, I mean, I've got colleagues here, my colleagues from the last administration, um, we're always trying to strike that balance because we have communities that suffer from not just violent crime, but nonviolent crime. And then, you know, the state court is also struggling with that. So. To, to nail down what I'm saying is this, is we can't not address those issues. Um, typically people think of you know, drug crimes as nonviolent crimes. Now, I'll argue differently to that, but to the extent that you're talking about drug crimes as nonviolent crimes, um, a lot of individuals' criminality is motivated by their drug addiction. And so you know, we have got to keep laser focused on the full panoply of threats to the community because one plays off the other, and if we take our foot off the gas on any, we're gonna lose. One thing I would say too is whatever it is, violent or nonviolent, uh, follow people, stay, stay connected. Not necessarily the, uh, perhaps the, 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 the prosecutor and the defense attorney, but a system where you stay with people. So when I talk to some of my colleagues now who are, who are in that thriving, contributing community, and I talk about Boston's really dramatic drop in violent crime, 152 homicides one year to, to 33. Uh, and so, uh, and now we're at about a 50, 55 a, a average a year. When I say, well, you know, we did thus and so and thus and so, that's why it went down. They said, no, no. Uh, the reason why crime went down is you locked everybody up, right? Uh, and I've had that conversation at least three times, right? Um, and I think the, the mistake we made, particularly in the faith community, is not to systematically and in a sustained way follow people into prison, right? So, it, so it's not a lock them up and throw away the key mindset, but it's to stay involved, stay engaged, because they're coming home, right? Because they have family members that still live in the community. Because what they do, and if you have the shots they call from inside can drive what happens on the outside. So whatever it is, whether it's a smaller, nonviolent crime, understand the community in which it happened, right? So it may seem like, well, that's just public urination, right? Uh, but not if you have to use a the laundromat there, right? So understand the community and then stay engaged with the person for whatever it is throughout the entire process. Just very quickly, I think it's, I think it's about balance. Uh, I think it's a big mistake to treat everything as equally important. I think we should be focusing primarily on the most serious offenses and of offenders. But at the same time, I see an overcorrection. -corre I think it's a good thing that we've moved away from policies of mass arrest and mass incarceration. But we can't create impunity for low-level offenses. And so I think an issue here is, of course, we should, de we should focus on the big stuff and not the small stuff. But that doesn't mean de facto decriminalizing small stuff. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Isaac. Uh, I'm also from Tampa. I know Diego. Um, I'm a former state prosecutor and currently a criminal defense attorney. 
I don't really have a question, but I have a few comments, and I invite the panel to, to maybe latch on to any one of them and discuss them. We didn't get to this point overnight, and we're not going to solve anything overnight. Um, in Hillsborough County, we have specialty courts. Some violent crime is the result of a variety of different issues, uh, whether it's the mental health or the uh, drug addiction courts. We have the veterans court. We have juvenile courts. One of the, one of the uh, silver linings that we're seeing is a tool building and skill building um, as a result of, of these courts taking these individuals and giving them uh, um, an opportunity for, for, for better hope because they now have a, a bigger toolbox to work with. I think that um, this is one of society's greatest challenges to overcome. And I see in, in my dealings over 30 years, um, foreigners come to this country and in less than one generation, they thrive from our public education system, yet generation after generation after generation, specifically of African Americans, they don't. And one of the challenges is that they don't come from nuclear homes. There's an overwhelming number of children that don't have two parents in the home and I think that that plays a very big part in the sustainability, at least that's my personal opinion, as to why it's difficult to sustain. Um, the children need two parents who are both productive, who stand for very good role models. And when you have a lack of hope and a lack of, of the uh, uh, perception that you're part of the American dream, it persists from generation to generation. And that's why I said we're not going to get there overnight, but to overcome, I think, one of these issues, we need to give um, a, a different paradigm, particularly in the African-American communities, as, as, as to a more nuclear family. You know, so just a comment on that. When I was a judge in Minnesota, I presided over both our drug court as well as, well as our veterans court. And those specialty courts have been very innovative and very uh, welcomed in the community, and we see tremendous success. I think you're right. We can't just think of business as usual. And the more that we can use those specialty courts to really, you know, for veterans, for example, um, you know, it used to be they would do one tour, come home. Now they're doing two, three tours. It's really they're suffering from alcoholism and drug addiction in a way that's self-medicating. And so those specialty courts, uh, the more that we can use them, the better. And then the other thing I'll comment on is, you know, a lot of judges would say sentencing is the hardest thing that they do. And I'll tell you the hardest thing I, the hardest cases I had to do were ter termination of parental rights. So cases where, you know, good people who are suffering from what, whatever mental health problem or addiction, they just aren't fit to parent. Um, and there's all kinds of evidence that, you know, it probably maybe does more damage to a kid to take them from that parent. So it is a complicated, complicated, and you're right, we didn't get here overnight, but the more that we at least keep trying to come up with innovative ways to deal with our problems um, and then measure if they're working. Yeah. Picking up on the notion of we, we didn't get there overnight, uh, meaning we're going to need a long view on, on how to approach this and picking up on the notion, you heard me say families, a number of times. So I want to just narrow that down and sharpen it a little bit and say fathers. Right? And so um, the, the importance of the father right, uh, and the, the development of the father, right, the uh, a focus on the father, even if the courts around child support. So the court's going to require you to pay, pay child support, but also develop you as a father. There were programs in Boston, and this is a, a sustainability thing. We're not sustaining it. So you're on probation. Uh, and so you have some obligation to the court. And so part of the way you, you work through your probation is to go and enter into a fatherhood program right? that the court runs. Uh, the, uh, the health commission has a father-friendly program, right, to support fathers. So, so some of that got to come, uh, uh, in, 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 you know, I read from, from James, that was James 127, right, uh, that the religion is going to be acceptable to God our Father, right? And so the, the focus 
on, on that uh, is, is key to the question around the family. Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to, um, Avi Combley, I'm from Indianapolis, uh, speak a little bit about the comment uh, you made about the police recruiting struggles. It's obviously happening in every major city. Yeah. And even in the suburbs, like as an example, my hometown is a suburb of Indianapolis where officers are very well compensated. They used to be getting 500 applicants for every one spot. Now they're getting to the point where they have 12 applicants for 18. So there seems to be a root cause that's greater than financial compensation or other things. And I was just wondering if there's any examination done into the root cause and how police recruitment can play a role in this bigger picture that we're talking about. I'll go ahead and take that. So um, I served on the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice, and we looked at the full scope of issues facing um, our communities in law enforcement and the demoralization of what has occurred for our law enforcement officers within the last two years has been devastating. It used to be that it was a proud tradition that a grandfather, then a father, and then a son, and now we have fathers saying, I would never encourage my son or my daughter to put on the uniform. And so until we can start building up the profession as it is, you know, look, 99.9% .9 of law enforcement officers are out there. In every profession, we're gonna find someone who didn't do their job in the right way. Um, but we've got to start building back up the respect for law enforcement officers such that people wanna take this on. Um, it's a frightening thing, you know, for people to put on a uniform. We need them. We should give them our thanks. We should have their backs. Um, and so I think as a community, we've got to do that. Everything that you can do to help in that cause, please. We celebrated in Boston a few weekends ago, Faith and Blue. Uh, it's, a, it's a national thing that goes on. It came through Boston as well. You heard me when I talked about the diamond on one corner is, is faith and the other is law, so faith, community, law enforcement partnerships. Uh, and it, but it's really, part of that is about um, honoring and supporting the profession. Uh, so uh, in Boston, we see a similar, we just put out a, a, a recruit class of new officers, 104. Uh, they're budgeted for 140. Uh, they know that there's attrition, right? So they, they oversubscribe it to 146. Attrition starts before the class even sits. So they sit 138, and they're like, well, let's find two more to push it up to 140 and couldn't. Uh, because and, and normally you would have a, a robust number, right, where you would, that, that's never happened before. So um, the... The, the strategies that, um, to, 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 to Thomas's point, the community is looking for good law enforcement services, right? Not oppressive, not uh, unfair, uh, not unjust, not, not, not overuse. Uh, and so it's a lot of education. Um, and you can, you can nerd out on just the law enforcement part. I mean, it's a complicated area. A lot of good jobs um, in the police department, and Boston's a well compensated. There's some really interesting good jobs that you can get, um, but but people uh, don't know, aren't aware, uh, and so it's it's a and, and and in addition to hiring people, you're also losing people. Uh, people are retiring faster than they're coming on, so it's a serious concern. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Beck. I'm a 1L at Yale Law School. Um, Paul, I know earlier you were talking about this ecosystem of actors who helps to inform uh, crime-fighting strategy, uh, chief of police, um, sheriff, mayor. I would be curious to hear all of your thoughts on how DAs and prosecutors play a big role in this equation. Um, I actually lived in Los Angeles this past year, and of course, George Gascon is an incredibly controversial figure. What, what happens, how do you flex your strategies when you're faced with a DA, like a Boudin, for instance, who might not be on board, or might who be coming from a totally different ideological standpoint? Uh, I think the question was to you. Do you, yeah. <laughs> you, you can go first. Uh, so I think I'm a, uh, I think I'm a, broken record about this, that you can have 
uh, you can pursue social justice and uh, effective law enforcement at the same time. And in fact, you must uh, do that. Um, you know, violence reduction, and in fact, anything in criminal justice, if you've been working in the system, as I have, uh, um, you know, former prosecutor, former state level uh, criminal justice leader, and at the federal level, uh, violence reduction is a team sport. And if the team doesn't play well, prevention, enforcement, all the different parts of enforcement, one thing that uh, is sort of a, a dirty secret that people don't talk about is that people assume that all sort of different types of law enforcement uh, actors all get along with one another in a jurisdiction. That couldn't be farther from the truth, often. So there's lots of tensions there as well. But making sure that people understand that the efforts, the anti-violence efforts in the city sort of succeed or fail together is a real uh, important thing. And I think actually, you know, the best case study of that is Boston. Um, in the, you know, I think that Boston uh, doesn't have a great reputation for racial reconciliation uh, in the rest of the country. But, you know, the, th the work that clergy and law enforcement did together, beginning with the 10-point coalition and moving forward, has really changed the fundamental sort of interactions in the city. And it's not an accident that the city is generally outperforming other, other cities. But I, and I think one of the things that's interesting is, you know, uh, you know, uh, Focus Deterrence or GVRS or whatever got its start in Boston. The Ten Point Coalition got its start in Boston. Those efforts are not formally in Boston anymore, but they did. They were successful enough for long enough that they sort of changed the underlying principles of the way Boston works and made it more collaborative. I mean, I would say in, in California, we've, in my lifetime at least, we've experienced both sides of both sides of addressing violent crime from a district attorney or a prosecutor's perspective and, and their kind of outlook or their goals in terms of addressing the issue. In the 1990s, for example, right, we had what folks refer to as the Clinton Crime Bill, Three Strikes Law which, and I'll say, you know, there certainly are individuals in communities who deserve to be put away for life and can't function in society and, and will continue to commit violent crimes. But there's also, you know, when you had folks in California getting a life sentence for stealing a piece of pizza or a candy bar, it's just ridiculous, right? And then it had to get to a point where the Supreme, Supreme Court judge in, in California like demanded AB 109 that in 2,000 inmates, 4,000 inmates be released because prisons were overpopulated, et cetera. So what, what tends to happen is, as, as a country, as a society, is we tend to swing to one side of the pendulum to the other side versus what's the hardest part is somewhere in the middle. That's really hard to do, what Thomas referenced earlier. Um, and so locking everybody up is not the answer. And most high-ranking law enforcement officials that get it acknowledge that and say that um, and also it's also not the answer is not let everybody out give them another chance and then some folks take that chance to go and commit a serious crime or kill somebody um, so and I think Gascon has a very difficult task on his hands because like right like how do you balance respecting and honoring and 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 pushing justice for victims of violent crime, while also trying to implement policies that give people a second chance who need a second chance, or alternative sentences, et cetera. And so it's, it's very difficult. Um, but I would say when the GRID office from 2008 up until the pandemic had its run of success, and violence was significantly down, 50-year lows in homicide, um, was when, as a city, and also as a state, we were switching from that, you know, sentencing 12-year-olds to 300 years to, to the other side of, of, like, what's fair, what makes sense, versus some of these sentencing enhancements, which were, which were just ridiculous, right? Um, so I, I'm not, I think the, the, the proper approach is in the middle, which is the hardest to do, is, is where I'll leave it at. I would say uh, the DA is extremely important. 
It's a very important office and, and one that the community needs to engage and the district attorney needs to engage the community. So, uh, so you can really, uh, uh, you can talk about a victim impact statement. You can talk about juvenile diversion. Uh, and you can really dig into very specific cases and people can come to learn more and more about how the court actually functions. Uh, one of the things that we do is, you heard it in my, my bio, the Violence Reduction Task Force, which meets at the L.J. Baker House, every Wednesday from 9 to 10, start on time. If it's 10.01, shut up, right? Uh, and uh, it involves law enforcement, different parts, involves faith community, involves community health service centers, it involves activists, interested uh, residents, um, and we go over what happened. And also in that meeting is the DA. So the DA is talking about what happened that week, that week bad in the court. And so you're following it, and we've done it since 1998, so it's one of the things we've sustained. Uh, and so if you're ever in Boston on a Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock, come by the Baker House and you can see that in operation. Thank you for your comments, Christopher McDonald. I'm on the Supreme Court of Iowa. You talked about a team approach and, and some programs and services. I'd be interested in knowing from the panelists, uh, what role do you think state courts can have in addressing this problem directly? Um, and have you seen examples of state courts being involved effectively in violence reduction programs? I think this piggybacks a little bit off the gentleman from Tampa you know, state courts do have a lot of innovative courts where they're either delivering services directly or managing the coordination of services. So we have domestic violence courts, drug courts, veterans courts, juvenile diversion courts. Uh, I just wanted to know if you'd seen examples of courts addressing uh, violence directly. I think we've talked uh, a bit about various uh, court-based innovations. There's drug courts, there's mental health courts, there's gun courts now mm -hmm. uh, that can be effective. But I also want to sort of take a moment maybe to pivot using this question to discuss a, a state issue, which is uh, state gun laws. And this is really kind of the elephant in the room, and I think we have an obligation to talk about it, even if we don't all agree. Uh, we, I think there's rough agreement among experts that there were three major causes of the homicide spike in 2000. One was the pandemic, of course. Two was the, uh, uh, the social unrest that followed the murder of George Floyd. And the third was the massive surge in legal gun sales, a surprisingly large share of which went directly into the criminal, criminal market. And I think rather than talking about the number of guns that we see out there, I think we have to talk about the access to guns and the access to guns on the street. Uh, in 1980, there was one state, Vermont, that had permitless carry. Today, we have 21. Those laws are always passed over the objection of local and state law enforcement who, don't want, uh, who desperately think that that is counter to their mission of public safety. I don't know what the right answer is. I favor uh, regulating guns the same way we regulate cars. But we have to start talking about this and we have to break the impasse about this. No other country addresses guns the way we do. We obviously are doing, we obviously need to change that somehow. I don't know what the uh, precise answer is, but we have to start, especially among thoughtful people on all sides of the issue, we have to start engaging on it. I, since we don't have any, I'll jump in just with one more question and then we can wrap up with conclusions from each of you. But um, while you're talking about guns and other things, what, how would you, I know you don't have the answer, so I'm going to push you a little on that and say, in your perfect world, how would you do it such that, right, the concern of many people is that you're just regulating law-abiding citizens and taking their guns away while Many of the guns seized in Chicago, for example, aren't traceable to any gun sale or anything like that. So what, what's your answer there? And 
how do you do it without policies like stop and frisk, which we know had some success, but at the cost of liberty? Well, I think one thing is, is that there's, there's, no, there's no perfect answer here. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that law-abiding citizens are going to have to, uh, who own and carry guns, will have to take on some additional inconveniences to prevent people who are mentally ill, who have a criminal record, all those things. Because right now, our gun market is incredibly leaky. So for instance, one of the things that we suspect but don't know for sure is because a lot of those gun sales in 2000 were to first-time gun owners who frankly didn't know how to uh, safe, uh, safeguard their gun, a lot of those guns got stolen. They got left in cars, the cars got stolen, and those guns found their way into the, uh, to the hands of criminals. We have to have some reasonable common sense restrictions, some, some training, some other things. And if you don't, and if you're not willing to take some minor inconveniences, you know, I don't think you should be able to own a gun if you're not willing to do the bare minimum uh, for something like that. That's my, that's my opinion. I think that's well-founded on the research. One of the things that we see with these permitless, permitless carry laws is 10 years after, uh, after them, we see about an 8 to 12% increase in all homicides traceable directly to those, uh, to those laws and not in other factors. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know what the, exactly the right, ish, uh, right thing is, is, but I think that the, the key thing is how do we have a common sense approach to making sure that those who shouldn't have guns don't have them. And I think, unfortunately, that does mean some modest burdens to the rest of us. So thank you for that question, Judge, and also for bringing this subject matter up. So um, I, I think the right... So talking about it, thoughtful people talking about it, is definitely a very important next step. Mm -hmm. um, the notion of, of we don't want guns in the hands of people who have no legal frame around owning a gun. We, it, it, we don't want it in the hands of someone who is going to intentionally use it to harm someone. How do we solve that problem? Right? Uh, Erica mentioned uh, time to crime. Right? Uh, another flip of that question might be, where did the gun come from? Right? So if we can have a deeper understanding of where did it come from, uh, then we can, we, that kind of information will help us address uh, the problem. So if you're talking about it from kind of a neighborhood level, we didn't, we don't make these guns, right? You know, uh, was it, it's not, where did, where, where did the 14 year old, why does the 14 year old boy have a gun? Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, the, 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 the illegal market, mm -hmm around guns is a real challenge. So people will say, well, those guns are coming from Massachusetts. They're not coming from here. They're coming from uh, New Hampshire. They're coming from down south. People get in them, they drive down south, get a bunch of guns, come up. And one of the reasons people might shift from the drug business to the gun business is more money in guns, mm -hmm. right? Or they'll switch to the people business. Mm -hmm. There's more money in selling people mm -hmm. than there is in selling drugs. So um, how to uh, dry up that market of, of, the, of the illegal sale of guns by having some, some state by state, some national guidance and regulation that stops people from being able to hop in a car, go down to Georgia, load it up with a bunch of guns, and then come sell it in, in, in Dorchester. Right? That, that's the problem that we want to try to solve. Mm -hmm. Well, concluding remarks. Uh, who wants to start? I'll start. Um, you know, it, it's been a great conversation. I've, I've taken away some stuff, including I never even thought about the issue of social media and devising a program around that. And to conclude that in our group violence intervention, I'm going to take that away. Um, I will tell you that the commission I referenced, the, the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice, if you go to the Department of Justice homepage, you'll see there's a very, very thick report uh, that was issued that addresses so many issues related to 
um, what's going on in our community. So I would recommend that to you. It's There's an executive summary, so don't worry. You don't have to read the whole thing. You can read the executive summary. But it talks about officer retention, recruiting. It talks about mental health and wellness for our law enforcement officers. It talks about the rule of law and the respect of the rule of law. Um, it's a really great report. It's comprehensive. The commission listened hours upon hours of testimony from experts, subject matter experts, and really came up with some very thoughtful recommendations. So if you're interested in this space, Department of Justice website, you can find that report. Mark? It's the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice. And if you put that at DOJ, it'll pull you right up to that report. Thank you. Um, I would just encourage you all, kind of what has taken place here, but we should be committed to, to doing it more moving forward is to have, is to be willing to be uncomfortable and have conversations in the sensible middle, as Thomas referred to. Um, and I think the pastor kind of referenced this earlier, I would say that, you know, all these efforts, all these models, all these statistics and approaches and ideas are great and are needed, and we need to keep doing them. But they're all essentially Band-Aids until we address root causes, right? And the pastor mentioned social determinants of health. However they started, whoever's fault it is, Poverty, easy access to guns, homelessness, mental health issues, substance abuse, single parent homes. Um, these community wide issues will continue to breed young men and women every week, every day, every two years, every generation who are willing to pick up a gun and use it. But the question is how did they arrive at that place in life? And so if we don't look that far back, We'll be here another 20, 30, 40 years having the same conversations of a new model and a new approach and patting ourselves on the back until the root causes in some of these cities is, are addressed. Um, and then one last thing is one big mistake that I've seen over the years is when a city or a foundation or a person falls in love with the model and they, and they see it as a cookie cutter approach and try to shove it in other communities, and that, and, and that isn't um, always a good idea. You should do the due diligence to make sure that there's a chance at success at least, and the community buys in before the model that you love is shoved into any given community. Um, I guess I, what I would say is um, what, what I'm hearing on the panel uh, is a lot of, opportun uh, uh, a lot of optimism uh, about the possibilities for uh, constructive work at the micro level, the micro partnerships. And I think what you're hearing, maybe, maybe most, mostly from me, is a lot of frustration uh, with our inability uh, to break some of these impasses at the macro level. And what I would just argue is we need to create a uh, new interest group of thoughtful people who want to solve this problem. Um, you know, Erica and, and the judge um, are, both, uh, are both former Trump appointees. I worked for President Obama. We obviously agree on more than we disagree. And I think that those types of partnerships are going to be uh, essential moving forward. I think the thing I would uh, say really in, in agreement is we can solve this. We, we can act, this is the problem we can solve. And I, I think, uh, I first heard, uh, it was a pastor who said it, and it would have been back in the violence that was surrounding the crack epidemic. So that's when Boston hit 152. That's when, that's when violent crime was really a surging, challenging problem, certainly in Boston. I mean, it was, it was gunfire every night, right? It was, it was people being shot all the time. And... There was a feeling of, we just can't, I sat in the basement of a church uh, with an intellectual leader uh, 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 in the black community, and he said, I don't think we can solve this without violating people's civil rights. I couldn't believe it. I, 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 I couldn't, you know, that, that I was sitting in a church in my community, uh, uh, and, and, and a black intellectual, we're not going to be able to solve the, the crime problem without violating people's civil rights. And um, not separate gathering, another pastor said, we, gentlemen, we can solve this problem. Uh, and so 
I, I think a lot of it begins at the micro level, uh, and because what works in Boston is not going to work in St. Louis. So, so picking it up and saying, do this, that, that, that the, the people of St. Louis will reject it, just on the face of it. Right? So, so, the, so working locally, but then having that macro, that, that, that dialogue, uh, that sustained conversation, um, and, and doing both of those things, because we can solve this. So I want to end by first thanking our panel, but also by saying this is a much bigger conversation than we can have in an hour and a half. And these four brilliant people have brought up a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts, but uh, none of us should be the critic and we should all, to steal from Teddy Roosevelt, be the man in the arena, meaning each of us can get involved. Each of us can take some of these ideas and run with them and go back to your own communities and push them. And I know we're all busy, but we have time to do this and it matters to our communities. And so I would implore you to take what you heard here today as just a first step and go out and learn for yourself. I can't tell you how important this is and how much the entire community will benefit from each of you just giving back a little in this area. The other thing that Thomas said that I, I couldn't agree with more is there are solutions to be had and we really need to be willing to work together and all set aside our preconceived notions and sit down at the table and roll up our sleeves and get to work and try things and fail and hopefully try things and succeed at the micro level and transfer those to the macro level when they succeed with the recognition that not everything's gonna work in every community. So this is an amazing panel. I commend them for taking the time to come here today and talk to you. I hope you'll take time to talk to them to the extent they're here throughout the conference and get ideas and take them back to your own communities. Thank you all very much and thank the panel.